Production funding for Another View comes from the Hampton Citizens Unity Commission, using the time, talents, and skills of a broad base of citizen volunteers to help break down racial and cultural barriers. Working to achieve the City of Hampton's community plan for a healthy, diverse community. And from the African American Programming Advisory Group, community visionaries assisting WHRO to engage, enlighten, educate, and entertain all communities in Hampton Roads. And now, another view. Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. The numbers are frightening. According to the Virginia Department of Health, in 2008, there were almost 18,000 cases of AIDS in the Commonwealth, 10,000 of which were African Americans. There were more than 12,000 cases of HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, and again, the highest numbers infected were African Americans. In this case, 8,100 of the 12,000. Why is this disease so prevalent in our community? We've asked the experts to help us understand. Jerome Cuffey is the Outreach Specialist and Youth Coordinator for Tidewater AIDS Community Task Force, or TACT. Dr. Angela Mercer is an internist who treats patients with HIV and AIDS. And Hildegard Richardson is the community health educator for Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Virginia. Welcome everybody to the program. How are you? Hi. The numbers just blow me away. I had no, because we're not hearing that much right now about HIV and AIDS in our community, or is it just kind of underground? Jerome, let's start with you. Um, I can say there is a lot of underground work being done on it, but at the same time, um, it should be more. It really should be more publicized. Um, we really need to talk about it more. And the videos and all those our kids are watching, those things, or in between those videos, those commercials should show and, and have that information put out there to the children, let them know that they need, need to be put more aware. But we're of not going seeing on. those types of PSAs, Hildegard, and, yeah. and, and like we see for childhood obesity or for diabetes or for a myriad of other diseases. Why no, is that? We don't see them anymore because as we go through fads and clothes and music. We go through disease fads as well. Right now, the big deal for children is childhood obesity. Uh, no one ever wants to talk about HIV disease because it's a sexually transmitted disease. Mm -hmm. When we were talking about the blood supply, that sort of thing, it was there. But now it is actually about a behavior. It's always been a behavior. but. Now we don't want to talk about sex. For the last few years, we've gone through abstinence only. Mm -hmm. No one actually wants to talk about children and teenagers being sexually active. You want to lose some friends? Talk to them about their teens having sex, and you can lose some friends. Because people do not want to acknowledge. It's hard to talk about your 11-year-old daughter being sexually mm -hmm. active. That that's the, brings up a whole issue there. Yes. But let me let me just say let me throw this at you, Dr. Mercer. Uh, Phil Wilson, who's the executive director of the Black AIDS Institute, back in 2005 was quoted as saying, "The truth of the matter in 2005, AIDS in America is virtually a black disease. The epidemic will not be over unless and until black people in America develop the capacity, infrastructure, and commitment to make it so." The time is now to create a comprehensive, coordinated mass mobilization against the AIDS epidemic in black America. At one point in time, this started out as, or people thought of it as a mm -hmm. white male gay disease. Right, and, and that was back in 1981 mm -hmm. when we first discovered. And over the years, um, the trend has really changed. Um, in the 90s, I get 1993, four, I think that's when we saw the, the uh, prevalence increase in our community. And it's just skyrocketed. You know, Sixty percent of the HIV cases that are being diagnosed now are African American patients, 60%. and sixty percent, but with twelve percent of the population. Mm. And it's it's um, I have to I don't know that it's a black disease. I think uh, African Americans are uh, disproportionately affected, as in many diseases. You know, there is mm -hmm. a huge disparity Why in is healthcare. That? Is it's the is it the disparity in healthcare? Uh, yes, there is a disparity in health care. Uh, we have more diabetes. Uh, men die of a higher rate of prostate, prostate. cancer. Mm -hmm. um, one big factor that, that I think patients, that, um, that the public doesn't understand is the lack of trust for the health care providers from the African American community. We always remember the syphilis incident and um, that was with Tuskegee, Tuskegee, Tuskegee mm -hmm. yes. And so 
we just uh, the African American patients don't always have a good amount of trust. Uh, they disbelieve that that uh, this is not that HIV is not a disease that was man-made, um, and and so I think that's a big problem. So that's a, that part of it, the conspiracy theory mm -hmm. that that, mm -hmm. that this is a an, a virus that has been injected into our into our community, right. yes. if you will. Mm -hmm. Jerome, you work on the streets with the kids on the, on a daily basis, with, with adults on a daily basis. What are people telling you about HIV and AIDS? And, and what are the behaviors that are causing this 60% number? I think that's the part of the biggest problem is getting people to change their behaviors. Um, you have a lot of people that uh, don't like to wear condoms or um, families don't allow condoms. Um, and the behavior issue is the biggest thing. They don't, um, the trust, like she said, of the health care providers. And, um, Talk to me a little bit more specifically about this trust issue. Is okay. it that you're going to, that the health care provider is going to, you know, tell their boss or tell their family? Or what, what is the trust factor? What it, exactly is It's hard is that? to get to the root of who, you know, when they say trust, but it's, they, in doing testing, because that is part of the job that I do is testing, we ask the various questions and they're um, reserved to give a lot of information, personal information about themselves, or sometimes they give misinformation. And we have to, you know, go about other ways to con hunt these people down or find partners and that thing. So it, it is a lot of misleading information, but mostly it's just the behaviors. It's, the biggest problem. So Hildegard, from Planned Parenthood's perspective, you all are teaching, trying to teach safe sex practices. I, people are not following mm -hmm. that. Well, when you look at the young people, especially the age group that I work with now, they're 11 to about 14 years old. If you're a young lady and you use or you have a condom, then mm -hmm. quote unquote, somebody thinks you're nasty or you're dirty. Mm -hmm. And young guys believe that uh, you are saying something negative about them if you ask them to use a condom. So what happens is, this is my boyfriend, I'm his wifey, mm. and I'm not a shorty. That means shorties are girls that... Shorties are girls that are, that are on the side. That have, yeah, the, the sideline mm -hmm. girl. Mm -hmm. I'm the wifey. I don't do that. And uh, you know, long-term committed relationships, when you start talking about that to a 13-year-old in middle school, a long-term committed relationship runs football season. <laughs> and after that, it's a basketball player. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's somebody running track, and then it's somebody for being at home in the summer. So you're talking about four, on the average of four long-term committed relationships in the school year. <laughs> and these girls are sexually active. And girls, women, they're finding are dying in, in, in higher numbers right. and c because they're contracting HIV and AIDS from, from this type of behavior. Well, what happens with that is because of the health disparities, economics, in the household, the first person that you see for a health issue is mm -hmm. the mama, the grandmama. Well, you're not going and telling them that something is wrong with you down there, quote, unquote, down there, mm -hmm. like we're talking about somewhere in Australia. <laughs> That's not a conversation. Mm -hmm. So what happens is they end up with a piggyback infection, such as syphilis or herpes, that causes a lesion that makes it more, the body the virus ready. More That's right, the body mm -hmm. can be more infected openly with mm -hmm. HIV, but with syphilis, the, the, the sore goes away with no treatment. So, quote unquote, I'm all right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what happens with it. And, and so you don't go to the doctor until it's a necessity. And you're not going into a clinic with a Medicaid card because the government will know. And they mm -hmm. may cut off my Your mama's, mama's money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's clear, let's get some definitions going for a minute. HIV. H is is <laughs> HIV is a virus, mm -hmm. and, um, and and it affects a person. It is not. It causes. It can cause AIDS. Uh, there are different definitions of AIDS, but with the CD, um, there is a an account that we use to follow uh, the disease called a CD4 count, and when that is below 200, then you have a definition of AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, and the other 
uh, characteristics that can occur with the, the AIDS diagnosis. But what we're trying to do now is once we find out that a patient is HIV positive, then we follow these parameters and they never become an uh, AIDS patient. An AIDS patient. Because we're able now, someone described it earlier um, to me as, as it's, it's now classified more as a chronic disease, yes. HIV infection, um, like diabetes and like uh, where you have it, it, you can't cure it, but you can live with it. Right. And, and that's why I think one of the reasons is that we are not uh, talking about it as much because it has become a chronic disease. And uh, that's why the funding is drying up as well. Another significant fact is because 60% of the patients now being diagnosed are African Americans. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, Jerome, what would you tell, uh, what do you tell people when you're counseling and when you're talking with them? I tell the clients that I come in contact with or patients that they have to treat everyone as if they have it. Um, because the numbers are in this area are alarming. Um, mm -hmm. We do have the largest rate of infection in the state. And it doesn't have a look anymore. It doesn't have a face anymore. So you have to treat everyone as if they have it mm -hmm. and protect your own body. That's what I tell them. And, and what kind of pushback do you get? Or what, what do they say to you? A lot of people are receptive to the information, but when I show them the actual numbers and the statistics they do, they're more prone to listen. And whether they leave out of my office and take my advice, you know, that's you know, neither here nor there. But I'm hoping that some, you know, I'm sure some people are getting the message as I'm telling it to them as, mm -hmm. before they leave. Talk to me a little bit about testing. You said you run some testing, a testing program also. Yes. What are the types of tests that are used and, and how does that process work? Well, we do uh, what's called an or quick advanced test. It is a preliminary test. It is a 20 minute test. Uh, we get a sample of blood and it takes, a, like I said, 20 minutes to, for the test to run to see if the antibodies are present. Because mm -hmm. um, that basically tells us whether the person could possibly be positive or not. They, sometimes there are false positives, but after that preliminary, we send the we do a confirmatory, and we send that one out to a lab. And once we get the results for that, then that lets us know what the definite results are. So, do you tell somebody at the end of that twenty-minute test what those results are? Yes. So they go away thinking they have it or not until, but then they, you have to follow up. Right. We follow up with the confirmatory. It takes about four to five days to get the results for that. And usually I call them back in and give them the results for that. And what's the usual reaction, Dr. Merson, when, when somebody comes to you and says, I just well, was tested? You know, when you get tested, though, the counselors are really um, skilled at doing pre and post counseling. So there is a specific way. It's not like a diabetic test. Or, right. You know, they talk to you, they explain to you if you are positive, then this, and if you are negative, then this. And so I think that with time and with an excellent counselor, the patients are um, saddened, but they're not, they don't feel that hopelessness that they used to feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you familiar with this, the, the counseling part yes. of that? And, and um, what exactly? The counseling part is so very, very important because when you're testing someone and they test positive, you have to know the resources, you have to know what to tell them, where to go. You need to have uh, doctors that you can refer to them to. But the other part of this is, again, back to health disparities and economics. Hmm. If so you don't have any health insurance, you can't get then we have to make a referral to uh, one of the local areas that will take them with no insurance, mm -hmm. where the wait can be very long. Uh, when you're looking at people living outside of the city of Norfolk in some of the outlying communities. Mm -hmm. We're talking of a transportation issue. And uh, sometimes we find that these people are not getting the treatment that they need to stay HIV positive mm -hmm. because it's just not accessible. And this is the sad, scary part. And when we have people that are HIV positive, we still have to deal with the stigma. It's a great stigma in the community, and particularly the African American community, that you just don't say that you're HIV infected. That's a dirty disease, a nasty person. Well, let me ask you this. Are you required, after you find out that you are HIV positive, to talk to your other partners, whoever wants to Yes, there you? is a requirement in the public health department will, has been able, um, is able now to notify partners mm -hmm. once 
that they, they find out who your partners are. But yeah. that goes back to the misinformation you were talking about, right. doesn't it? Right, but it's part of the counseling part that we do also, because mm -hmm. we have someone that tests positive. There's a partner counseling and the referral process that we do where we have to contact a list of partners within the last year or two years. We contact those partners and not tell them who actually infected them, but mm -hmm. let them know that they may have come in contact with someone that's positive and they need to get tested. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's good with this disease though, that the, the funds are there. I mean, you, we, uh, we don't have the same funds available for diabetic hypertensive patients that they do for the HIV positive patients. Mm -hmm. If you're uninsured, there is uh, there are um, ways to, to, yes, there are resources and ways to mm -hmm. obtain medication and, and for even getting tested, there are um, a lot of different um, agencies that will do the uh, confidential testing and refer you. Mm -hmm. Hold on, I want to go back to something that you mentioned about the, the stigma. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you get the families or, or how do we get the community to start seeing this disease in a different light and, and encouraging each other to, to stop this risky behavior so that you don't have to face it? Well, education and, and we have to have a certain place to educate. We can do certain things in the school system, but there are lots of uh, restrictions on talking about HIV disease and STDs in the schools. But we have to use other areas, other community forums, churches, mm -hmm. civic and social organizations, your Greek organizations. One time everyone had an AIDS education program, mm -hmm. but now they don't have them as often because as one young lady said to me, I thought that was over, Miss Hildegard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you find that the same way, Jerome, that people think it's over? Yeah. So what message would you tell the community you have this opportunity right now about um, HIV and AIDS? And like I said before, it's very much prevalent, it's very much here, and this thing is like a Rubik's Cube. I mean, African-American women are on the rise as far as the number of cases that are being reported, but it's just going to keep changing dynamics. That's it's just going to keep changing colors and forms. And we have to get a hold of behaviors. So we have to start at the root of the problem is the, the behaviors. It's not um, the, the education is there. It's people to go out and educate, but the behaviors is what needs to change. Yes. So I guess I'm, I'm still trying to get to the root for people who, who are at home and, and who may not be facing this mm -hmm. right now. Um, what the denial factor? Yes. You know, it's a very denial factor. Very bad. Denial. Where, and, and how do you deal with that? I mean, people are just saying, you know, this can't happen to me. Well, yes, families, they families need to they talk are. about it. Yes, mm -hmm. families. And they talk about it in church. There's a mission, um, the Bomb and Gilead yes. uh, was developed a few, few years ago, and that's a, a ministry, mm -hmm. a national ministry that is uh, used to help fight. Mm -hmm. But the, the families need to talk about it. And if, if uh, I have patients that just still have not told, they've been positive for yes. years, they're on medication, yes, they're wonderful, they'll live to be 60 or 70 on their mess, and they still haven't told their family members That's that they're right. positive. Mm -hmm. have no idea. Mm -hmm. wow. Because they don't want to be ostracized, they are afraid. Mm -hmm. Because when you talk about a disease that's transmitted sexually, mm -hmm. now you're talking about, I'm not, if it's a female, a good girl. Uh, There's all kinds see, of moral things yeah, that are see, And people don't realize it. But African American people are extremely sexually conservative. Uh, I talk with young children that I know that are sexually active. But when you start talking about sexually transmitted infections, HIV, they have all kinds of like, oh, mm -hmm. that can never happen to me. But they're sexually active. We don't put together the information and the behavior. And then we have to think about this other situation, man sharing. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. prevalent mm -hmm. in the African American community. I am the wife and some people think that the little ring on the third finger left hand Means protects that them. Not going else. And mm -hmm. it, 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 it's not a protection. And, and we also don't want to address some other issues in our community that we need to talk about. And we have to start in two places, the home parents have to be very open mm -hmm. and very honest and form a dialogue with their children 
about sexual issues. Okay, and I know we could go on and right. on and on, but we are out of time. Oh. But I really appreciate you all coming on, and um, we will have each of your websites on our website that people can find oh. out if they want to come um, and get more information. Thank you so much. We appreciate the conversation. That's our thanks to Jerome Cuffey with TAC, Dr. Angela Mercer, and Hildegard Richardson of Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Virginia. When we come back, diabetes and your eyesight, and another chance for a fresh start for some local women. But first, here's what's happening in Hampton Roads. Welcome back. In tonight's lifestyle segment, how diabetes affects your eyesight. Here's Another View's health expert, Dr. Christina Ramsey. Diabetes is a disease of the blood vessels inside your body, and you have blood vessels inside your eye. So if those blood vessels get weak, um, they'll start to bleed inside your eye. So you'll start uh, losing a little bit of vision, little spots or floaters in front of your eyes. And if it gets even worse, you may be at risk of even losing all of your eyesight. What I have here are a pair of glasses that simulate what loss of vision related to diabetes. So I have the patients try these on to just really drive home the fact that we need to control the blood sugar. So the second you're diagnosed as a diabetic, you need to see your optometrist? Optometrist, yes. You need to come every single year um, because the longer you have diabetes, uh, the more likely you'll have the uh, complications from it. Once you're diagnosed with diabetes, how often do you need to come in for eye exams? Once you become diagnosed with diabetes, you should come into your optometrist every year for a full dilated exam. And that way we can keep track to make sure that you're not developing any complications from your diabetes. And you also need to keep a team of medical professionals um, with you, your optometrist, your dentist, your endocrinologist. We all work as a team in order for you to be, have, get the best health care. This next story has a special place in my heart because I have seen firsthand the impact this program has on the lives of women. It's called the Fresh Start Program, a chance for women who've been through hard times to start over. It's hard work, but the rewards are tremendous. Here's Lisa Godley with the story. <laughs> Amy Barrett Battle has good reason to smile, but it wasn't long ago that Amy had very little to smile about. Um, I could barely get out of bed. I was suffering with depression and I um, also had some other issues. Abusive relationship, abusing myself through self-medicating because I didn't have insurance. So, and also some near, near death experiences. Some were self-inflicted and others just being in the wrong environment. And I basically just wanted to hide hide in my bed, under my covers, and not do anything. But thanks to a program called Fresh Start, Amy got just that and is turning her life around. I am now attending TCC with a 4.0 grade point average. Despite not having financial aid and having to, you know, basically scrape by, it's, it's been still a wonderful experience. Um, my major is in social science, and I will, um, transfer that to a four-year college for a social work program. Fresh Start is a partnership between Tidewater Community College's Women's Center and Portsmouth Redevelopment and Housing, giving women not only an opportunity to advance in their education, but to deal with some social issues that might be holding them back. Minnie Whitehead is a licensed clinical social worker who works with the women who come into the Fresh Start program. She says one of the first things they want to do for women is give them hope. These uh, women are at least 18 years of age. Uh, we have worked with women uh, in their mid-60s. Uh, they come from um, environments where there's been intergenerational poverty, uh, domestic violence. Uh, they have histories of substance abuse, uh, depression. Uh, many of the women are single, uh, uh, single parents. Uh, with uh, low or no income. 
During the 12 week program, women like Amy develop strategies to help them overcome barriers. They learn critical thinking skills to help them make better decisions, as well as acquire the tools needed to repair fractured relationships. After dealing with past pain, they can concentrate on creating a better future for themselves and their families. And it may be hard, but in each step, if you go through the process, each step is actually a blessing in disguise. You get so many opportunities and so many doors open to you, and the growth is also a beautiful thing. Um, if you just allow yourself to step out there, step out there on faith, you know, I have faith in God now, and you step out there on faith and just allow the things that are meant to come your way to come your way. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. We hope we've given you a lot to think about in tonight's program. Don't forget to sign up for our e-news, e-view newsletter. Visit www.anotherview.tv for more information. You can also blog us there or write us the old-fashioned way at 5200 Hampton Boulevard, Norfolk. Next week, planning the perfect wedding. And grooms, there's something for you, too. We'll see you next time for Another View. Production funding for Another View comes from Hampton's 400th Anniversary Committee and the Hampton Neighborhood Commission. Partnering with neighborhoods throughout the city, working hand in hand to create vibrant places we are proud to call home and celebrate. And from the African American Programming Advisory Group, community visionaries assisting WHRO to engage, enlighten, educate, and entertain all communities in Hampton Roads.